hi guys welcome to my channel um this is kind of just a little vlog thing so it's not kind of well it's a vlog i'm, I'm doing a vlog i'm getting ready it, it's a get ready with me thing or i'm getting ready i was not crying um i was putting my contacts in and now my face is dewy so on the agenda today um we will be hanging out with one of my uh, like my nephew uh, we have the same birthday, which is interesting because it's not the first time in our family that people have had double birthdays. My eldest also shares a birthday with my uh, brother-in-law, and then um, my nephew and I share a birthday. Um, to me, I try not to like get wrapped up in it because I think that my like personal life experience has been filled with so much pain and stuff that sometimes I look at it as like my birthday is um uh I guess I have I guess I have ambivalence towards it so when someone else shares my birthday I'm just like are we okay <laughs> you know but I, I try not to project that onto anybody I really do try not to project my own horseshit onto anybody because it's unfair uh for their experience so yeah, but it, it's cool and strange. You know what I mean? That there's uh, there's actually more doubles in the family, but it's more extended. So I'm just getting ready. I'm still in my nightgown. I try to wear something elegant to sleep in uh, most of the time. I don't ever go to sleep in like pajamas it, that are like um, shirts and big shorts or whatever because I have like this extreme... Uh, Thing about dying in my sleep I don't know and so when they find me I want me to uh, I want to look pretty <laughs> so that's kind of why I always wear it I like go out purposefully and I'll, I'll buy like really nice little nightgowns and silk things and whatnot to sleep in like a 1970s vampire <laughs> you know what I mean that's uh yeah <laughs> it's kind of what I'm into um so yeah, so that we're just doing a uh, kind of get ready with me, I guess, style vlog right now. And nobody's awake, which is strange. And then also I have to get ready to go out in public, true public, not just like to the store. But we're going to go to a trampoline park. Um, and it's a Saturday, so I'm sure there's going to be tons of teenagers. Um, I have to prepare <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. But it, it is um, a lot of work. I want to go to a place that is uh, like an amusement park or something with my kids. I can't just let them go. And, if, you know, I just, fine, I'm just going to be sitting over here doing whatever uh, with my family and very, you know, involved um, with their activities and what they do. We have like a very, you know, close connection. There's an open communication between my children and I. So we, anytime they go somewhere, even like at a trampoline park or whatever, um, I don't like just allowing them to wander. I like shadowing from a distance and hanging out and observing, but it's just, you know, I, I don't want anything to happen to them. And I suppose, yeah, I, I guess I kind of am a helicopter parent, but it's, it's more or less, I, I care. Um, and I don't want anything to happen to my children. And I've gone through so many experiences. It's also me dropping the hammer or the axe or the sword and saying, absolutely not with my kids, you know? So, yeah. So this is kind of funny because you're going to see how I put my makeup on. I like putting my makeup on in a certain way because it gives me... Um, First of all, I laugh at it. But second of all, I actually like the way the shadows and the contour is on my face. So let me try to find my, uh, like a headband to put the floof away. Okay, so I like using, uh, well, first of all, this contour stick is really fucking cool. On one end, it's complete white. And on the other end, it's brown. The contour and highlight, I suppose. But it's from the Nightmare Before Christmas, Wet and Wild. You could get it anywhere. Um, so... Yeah, you're going to see how I do my makeup, which I think is funny. Um, but, yeah. So, I, I just really have to prepare myself uh, physically to leave the house and go um, be in a 
Um, okay, so let me go into the trampoline park, all right? The reason why I'm talking and speaking on like shadowing and things like that. Um, so, this is how I do my makeup. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I've had a lot of very, very dark experiences personally that I've survived from in my life. And I always say it takes thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours of therapy to survive trauma. It truly, truly does. If you want to get past it and you don't want to just, you know, envelop yourself in alcoholism or, you know, addiction. It takes thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours and tons and tons of time. It truly is a, a lifelong love affair to heal yourself. It's, yeah, it is. So that being said, um, it's difficult. <laughs> it's very, very difficult. And, um... It's, uh, yeah, so I, I just don't want anything bad happening to my kids. So this trampoline park, there is, uh, there's multiple of them. They're all over the, the state, uh, probably also other places as well. So it's pretty popular. We've gone to it in San Antonio. They have some Houston, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? In major cities. In a town near you. Um, but the one here. The one in San Antonio has an understanding that lawsuits happen. And uh, uh, you signing your rights away isn't going to stop somebody from suing if something catastrophic happens at a trampoline park, such as, like, somebody snapping their fucking neck because of your negligence, okay? And uh, um, a good lawyer can also fight um, anything you put, like, a, a stupid a thing, a stupid little waiver saying well technically you signed your rights away whenever you came into the park because that's also something that happens within the park you have to sign um a whole you have to do a lot of paperwork before you go into the trampoline park because they're pff, you could die right it's uh kids having fun you know and um with fun there is a tendency to die no <laughs> i'm just kidding but yeah so i <sighs> This particular branch, the manager, owner, general manager, the, the person who has opened up this part of the franchise here or whatever, is strange and peculiar because they choose to keep the lights off. So it's constantly pitch black in there. And I have to follow my child around in pitch black darkness uh, with tons of other kids screaming you know it, like it's kind of fucked up and scary at the same time do you understand what i'm saying um for some reason this particular branch of this business loves a good blackout sesh and when you have teenagers and hormones and six-year-olds four-year-olds and babies i mean i saw one time a baby was sleeping on a trampoline and i was just like everyone stay the fuck away from it like try to protect it because i'm very much like that i am uh, i am very much like a protector of tiny things so or things without a voice and um i want them to be safe and yeah some people have shamed me over the years for that especially people who later on i found out were horrific individuals they've shamed me and been like you're a helicopter parent you're a freak i don't like what you do you know but it, it all in all when it came down to it at the end of the day they were just complete shitty people so i shouldn't have ever felt offended by what they said you know what i mean they're they're whatever i'd rather be called a helicopter parent than something happen to my kids because i think that um uh, first of all don't mess with me. Second of all, number one, don't. Number two, please don't. <laughs> no. Anyways, like I said, I gotta prepare myself mentally for that whole fucking game I'm about to go play. Which I don't like. I mean, he's he, my son is eight. Uh, my youngest and my eldest is 13. So, you know. But um, I still don't trust humans. I still don't trust them. Not enough to uh, truly... Um, allow my eight-year-old to run around in a completely dark trampoline park filled with other individuals who have agendas that are unbeknownst to me right so i don't feel bad i don't feel bad um 
I just like explaining things because I feel a lot of the time I get misunderstood. Um, whenever I just rattle out the short version of things. And also, um, also I've been noticing within myself, I have this tendency to, um, I don't know, it's like one of my favorite coping mechanisms is, um, uh, make like dark humor instead of, um, open up my mouth and, and tell people how I actually, um, feel about things because it's just so difficult, um, the amount of, uh, the, should I, the, like, the mental mind games and loops I have to go through to deal with, uh, truly, like, having a real big boy conversation with people, especially here, so it's just so much easier for me. Their, their chosen form of communication is not this, me talking like this, so, um, a lot of the time, it's, uh, you know, cussing, joking, screaming, ha 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 ha, very loud. Um, it's almost like hyenas playing. It's, um, it's, so it's difficult. And it's something that I can understand. Um, I, I can understand it. I can get down with it. I could go down to these levels of communication and communicate with you in, the, in those ways. I can get to your level to communicate because I don't, I think it's just guilt. It's personally guilt um, from my past of like, not guilt, perhaps shame. It's some form of like icky feeling. It's some form of icky feeling that's shoved into my, um, the ripples of my mind that has caused me to um, always, 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 always feel like I need to understand what you're saying because nobody was there understanding or taking the time to do that for me and that hurt it, it hurt a lot so i don't want anyone else to hurt like that perhaps it, it is some form of guilt or shame i don't know um but also trauma because I, I feel like i have to over explain things because as a kid there's a tendency for people to misunderstand me or um because they misunderstood me they lie about me um from what they perceive what i said right what the the in summary, what I said, and then they go and tell people that. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not what I said at all. I literally didn't speak those words. What the fuck? Um, but yeah, okay, so this is funny. This is funny. I like doing my makeup like that because of the... <sighs> also, this is a rare occasion. I just woke up. I haven't had coffee. This is me without coffee. Me without coffee is like, very fast. I'm very, very fast. And, um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, very annoying. So whenever I do drink coffee, what happens is it like, there's something in my brain. I don't know. My therapist said that it's possible like ADHD, like severe ADHD, that caffeine will slow me down. Um, uh, so yeah. But yeah, I, I like doing my makeup like this because it actually, you saw the beginning and now you see how it is now. It creates a really good human mask. Um, so yeah. But yeah, I just, my ears are all red. My ears are red, like a little, mouse, a little mousy. Um, I have mouse ears. So anyways, uh, coffee, yeah. I haven't had coffee yet, so this is me without coffee and uh, do I like myself without coffee yeah but I think that so many people over the years have told me I was so annoying I'm like shut the fuck up you're so annoying but I think well, after so long of you hearing your peers and stuff like that saying things like that to you uh, perhaps with me I was just like okay I can shapeshift into what role do you need me to play you know I got this smacker this beauty blender which is nice but i actually like the the brushes more the brushes are, are fun and it reminds me of painting and i i love painting so i love painting um my friend and i share kind of a, a strange experience with painting and that is um a secret no <laughs> i'm kidding <laughs> am i gonna tell you or not Mm, let me just crank the wheel of fortune and see where it lands. No, but um, me and my friend ha do have a very similar experience. I'm going to be going in with this um, highlighter. I like putting highlighter all over my face. So that way, if like, you know, I'm on a desert island somewhere, I can like signal to someone. 
and I'm here. No, I'm kidding. But I think this is the wrong one. Me and my friend, we have a similar um, plutonium. Underworldly. Uh, let me try to find the correct word for this. Me and my friend are friends. And so with that, we're best friends. <laughs> no, but we do have a very similar creative process. It, and yeah, it is light years away. It is very, very different. But there's one pin on the giant board that we share. And that is um, the way we feel about art or the way we feel about um, creating stuff ourselves. It's almost, I'm going to shift away from her into how I feel now. It is almost like, for me, I'm not going to say this is not for her, but this is for me. But we've shared conversations that are kind of similar. So I'll back to how I feel personally is when I do create something, um, first of all, it's usually because of pain. It's usually some kind of, it's like where my creation comes from uh some kind of pain i'm like ow what the hell is this and then i like rip it out and it's squirming and i'm like ah <laughs> oh i got you you fucking painful thing and then i make out and i make out i make art out <laughs> and then i make out with it like, oh you horrible squirming thing i love you put it back in there no um but i do make art out of things whenever i finally have the there's like a Mm, a shift within me that happens signifying it's time to make art you know what I mean it's time to make a specific kind of art it's a time to use a specific kind of media for our creative expression and I'm extremely critical on myself about my personal like my art I really truly am so it's difficult for me to do that it's almost like a contract or a negotiation I have to go into with myself I'm like okay I'm going to make art you cannot judge yourself until you know so I try to clock out I'm like okay well I'm feeling it I'm here whatever and um sometimes it comes out of rejection I'm like wow I'm, I'm alone I'm all alone La -la -la. time to make art on the walls of my cave and so I do I think it's every mammal goes that right um but yeah I, so I do have a tendency to be a little bit self-destructive with my um creative endeavors and i'm extremely critical um, i wish i could um i wish i could own it and just be like yes i made this and if you have questions i can answer them unfortunately unfortunately i can't do that i can't do that um what i do is i create something much like frankenstein and then i look at the thing i created and i go i'm ashamed of myself and then um it, and it's funny because it's just misplaced shame it's like uh, other people were ashamed of me living and so i took on that shame and it's unfortunate and unfair for my fucking self that i have to constantly battle with things that aren't even mine to begin with it, it's difficult letting go is also difficult because there's a lot of uh, revelation that has to happen within yourself much like an apocalypse of the mind that has to happen you know a war within yourself and then you have to really truly um take out the things not take out i guess just integrate is the right thing to say you really have to integrate the things that creep and crawl <sighs> that are yours and yet that are not yours you know what i mean oh i'm sorry i didn't tell you um i'm using this uh zombie apocalypse as like setting in my face and yes it's white i had somebody comment the other day um, mommy mommy look a witch and i don't know i was like Sometimes I'll look at kids at the store and I'm just like, <laughs> when their parents aren't looking. I'm just kidding. I don't do that. My husband does that, though. He makes funny faces at kids whenever their parents aren't looking. He's like, you know, <laughs> Nosferatu. <laughs> oh, my God. There's this video. Every time I see it, there's this really, really funny video. I'll probably get back to, like, the whole integrating the shadow thing later. Whenever um, I come back to that. I'll get back to it. I guess it's it's my channel. I don't really have to sit here and explain things. And if I do, it's because of me. But, uh, fuck. I've already mentioned it, so now I have to say it. Because I, uh, you know, because I think that a lot of um, humans, you hear things, and then if it's at such a young age, you really 
take them personally, you take them to heart, so to speak, right? And in the heart where you take it is where your creativity lies. It's the, the hearth of the body, the seat of the soul. And so you will end up finding yourself in these, um, I don't know, it feels like hell. It truly feels like hell and torment when you actually have to sit there and walk down those stairs into the um, the underworld, into your personal underworld that is connected to the, the larger underworld, the larger one, you know, at large. And um, you have to look at the things that are in your halls and in your doors. And each door is a new thing. So it is um, it is difficult. And it's not for uh, the, the weak. And it's very hard. And I don't blame anybody who doesn't want to do the work. Because it is, it is work. It's not a vacation. You don't go into the underworld and go, Vacation's where I want to be. Everybody on the beach where the sun is free. You don't do that. You don't, you know, go down there. I mean, sometimes, I guess, if you're like, Le idiot, the fool, sometimes you're on the cliff and you're like, flowers are fantastic. And your dog's like, you dumb bitch, you're about to fall off the cliff. <laughs> right, 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 right. Or the courage to cower the dog. <laughs> you know, so... Um, so I don't, I don't blame anyone for not wanting to do the work. It's work. Who the fuck wants to sit there and constantly put themselves. Who the fuck wants to sit there and constantly, constantly be like, I gotta go to work and then walk to hell. <laughs> and then walk straight to their personal hell and go, Hey guys, how are y'all doing? And everyone's there like, Rah! Get, make some noise i'm here guys you know and all of your personal things that you're trying to integrate are like just in the shadows with no big boy words because they're more concepts than they truly are like entities it's just strange it's strange but a lot of healing happens if you can do the work if you could take the time if you have the courage or if something happens kind of like there's some that a trigger that'll happen and propel certain people into the underworld i find personally though for myself and my experience uh if you go willingly and it's always around the time of autumn i was i was born on the first day of autumn that's the one thing i do Per my personality does grasp to because I think it's important to clock the days we're born. It, your birthday is important. The day you have descended, you chose to descend into matter. And perhaps you didn't choose to, but there was a choosing of you going through those gates into this realm of existence from the watery depths of the placenta. Correct. So it is important. It's the day you crawled out of the underworld. And it, it is a day that you, you know, in, indigenous cultures truly do have more life than Western culture. And it's extraordinarily sad how Western culture has defiled and disgraced and tried to destroy the three d's defiled say it with me children defiled disgrace destroyed um the you know indigenous cultures and their stories because they had such a sacred way of integrating these things when a man became a man they had a ritual to really solidify now you are a man so let's go on a journey a serious journey um, surrounded by your family, your community of men. And it was like, a, it's an initiation. It is a true initiation, which is something that I'm also extremely interested in, is that initiation that happens. So back to the trigger that sends people. Sorry, I need to go drink coffee. But back to the trigger. Uh, this is so funny that I'm speaking like this without coffee because uh, it's like a more... <laughs> Coffee turns me into kind of a jester and I'm just like, I'm slower, but I, everything becomes more funny. The flavor of my brain, the soup in the kitchen starts tasting funny. <sighs> Is there wine in this? No, but um, no. Back to the initiation part. There is an initiatory um, event that generally happens for people um, that sends them into the underworld. Now, a lot of the time it's glorified for males. Uh, the story is always particularly catered towards 
men um, or, you know, just uh, manhood because for women, the initiation is very uh, sudden and violent and confusing and absolutely scary. Um, it is one that you're, you're covered in blood. I guess I'm going to speak from my perspective because I do have a uterus. And so my initiation was having fun and being a kid and um, playing in the pastures. I remember the first day that I received my initiation into the underworld as a, like a child, um, truly via like our reproductive, like, shifts and hormones as being a mammal right as being a human the initiation into the human underworld because other times i had been to the underworld um like you know through cracks and crevices on accident sliding down strange holes and figuring out what's going on down here but the true like true like initiation that happens hormonally the development that shifts your life basically i guess until the day you die or until you remove your reproductive organs um it was I was playing in the pastures with my friends. We lived in the middle of nowhere, basically, in Texas. And I was having fun, and we would hang out near um, the end of this dirt road that we all lived off the end of a dirt road. And it was the year, I think it was the year it snowed here when I was a child. Um, but anyways, so, it, which is extremely rare to snow in South Texas. Um, so, and that much, it snowed like three feet. It was really amazing. So I guess that's kind of funny now that I think back to that um, experience that it snowed the year I got my period or whatever, it, three feet, a, an extraordinary amount of snow. So, especially for coastal towns or towns close to the coast because the um, meteorologically, the you know, the weather here prevents that from happening. There's a fight that happens between the humidity and the salt and the snow. So the snow had won and overcome, and there was a large amount of snow here. So here I got my period, how funny. But I was playing with my friends in the pastures, and everything was this beautiful golden color, like sun rays at sunset. Everything that was touched was gold. And um, it was the first time since I was perhaps four that somebody... Somebody had some eyeliner, some like this other girls, those kids would meet up at the end of this dirt road and hang out on the, there was a, like a open field of cows we weren't really allowed to go to. That was like the realm that wasn't accessible to us, but I was always adventurous as a child. So sometimes when I was alone, when nobody could tell on me, I would go adventuring into places I wasn't supposed to be. Um, but when I was hanging out with like the neighborhood kids who lived at the end of this dirt road, one of them, uh, there was a, like a Latina, there was a girl and um, her name was Maria, which is so funny now, Mary, her name was Maria and she was very rude. She was extremely rude and a total bitch and she let me know that I was a not Mexican. I was not Mexican because I didn't, you know, she had a whole laundry list of reasons why I couldn't allow myself to be what I was. Um, but she had eyeliner. She was like, would you want some of this? Do you want some of this? Like, it was such a strange thing. The first time I tried eyeliner was uh, ironically the day I had, um, my period. <laughs> so I'm sitting there on the fence. There's like a three board fence, right? And that's, that's what us kids would do. We'd sit there on the edge of these golden fields that were, um, not supposed to go into, and we would just look at them and have fun and joke about things. And generally it was like um, one of my friends had a uh, Nintendo 64. So we would joke about like um, different games. He was playing something like Conker's Bad Fur Day. And um, um, we were talking about Mario and Sonic. And we would run around as me and a bunch of like neighborhood little boys would run around. I was very boyish. And so I felt comfortable just being around boys and rough housing and goofing and playing. I was, you know, always doing things like that. Climbing into trees and seeing how far you could throw rocks and seeing how far you could kick your shoe over the power lines and things like that. So um, she came up and she was like, you know, she's very feminine at such a young age. Perhaps she had received her gift 
uh, sooner than I had, but she was like, I have this new thing. And it was eyeliner and it was like cream black eyeliner or whatever, like a pencil. And so she was like putting it on all the girls and she was like, do you want some? Would you like some kind of thing? But she was Hispanic. So she was like, girl, get over here. No, she wasn't like, do you want some? It's like my making fun of people voice, <laughs> and, which is better because I used to have a Scottish accent when I would make fun of people. And my husband was like, what are you saying? And I was like, it doesn't matter what I'm saying. I'm saying something and it's funny to me. So anyway, she was like, do you want some? And I was like, uh, what, what is it? What is it? Do what is it? I was very skittish. What is it? It's just eyeliner. And she, she goes to put it on me. She's like, come here, stupid kind of thing. And she's like, here's how you put it on. And she put it on me. And all the guys were running around horsing, but she had like grabbed me out of the group and was like, you, come here. Do you want some of this? Ah. She was so proud of showing off her eyeliner. Her eyeliner. Peculiar. <laughs> Whatever. So she put it on me and I was like, well, how do I look? We didn't have a mirror. And I was like, whoa. And I remember all the boys, were, they were fun and having fun. They came up to us and they're like, hey, what's up? Blah, blah. And they stopped and they're like, wow. Like something had shifted. They were like, wow, your eyes are so different. And the way they stopped treating me like a friend and started treating me a different way made me feel scared. I was so scared. I was like, what do you mean? Is it ugly? Blah, blah, blah. And they, they were like, oh, no, it's, it's just, it's uh, it's all, uh, you know? And she was like, well, what do you guys think? What do you guys think about her? And then it became like, I was on display and I had to like sit there and, and be at the mercy of all of my friends' <laughs> judgment, which was not what I was into. We were into playing, climbing things, throwing rocks, kicking shoes over power lines, Sometimes hitting the power lines and going, fuck, run. Um, and then, um, you know, scattering or whatever. And then whenever the lights got low, whenever it was time for bed, when all the street lights, which were rare, there was like one street light down the way. When the street lights had come on, they're like, okay, goodbye. Like an endless, beautiful summer of just childhood. And I guess it was such a strange time. Shortly after that, I started having like weird dreams. And things like that. I guess it's just hormonal changes but um yeah it was very strange so what I did was they started judging me and telling me things I ran home to my house I looked myself in the face I was like oh god and it, it was it was eyeliner but it was like you know it was a strange feeling so I tried to wash it off because I wasn't allowed to wear makeup um and so I was washing it and washing it and it wouldn't come off it wouldn't come off no matter what I even put soap in my eyes and they burned and, and I was so afraid of my mom figuring out that somebody put eyeliner on me. Um, so then I guess from that experience, like then that day, the whole cycle had started as well. And I knew that my mom would eventually figure out that someone had put eyeliner on me because I was had to ask her about something very serious. I thought I was dying. So the female... Um, descent into the underworld is is different it comes at a strange time um and you forever lose your male comrades because they become um also at that time if they're not already into you know if there are not if they haven't hit puberty themselves and began that strange <laughs> experience um then they will and so you have to understand they have, their parents have talks with them of things that they have no idea or didn't know about before or perhaps did, but it was different. Or maybe their parents don't talk to them about that. And then some other child who has been initiated into these things tells them, you know, like a telephone game. And so it was the year um, everything in my life really started shifting around. And it was very, very confusing. And so from then on, I stopped playing with the neighborhood kids. I would go and hide in trees and kind of observe them instead, which is kind of weird looking back. It was very, very weird. Um, but we would tell stories of La Lechuza, like the witch woman. We would tell old Mexi folk, Mexican folk tales to each other. And La Lechuza was something that I found to be very interesting, like the old witch that lived in the trees and you couldn't tell and she could shapeshift into owls and um 
you know, just an old witch woman. And I was like, no, 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 it's true, it's true. My mom has seen her. And, you know, we were just telling stories. Another story that my mom really liked telling me, um, she liked telling me horror stories um, or, or legends or dark myths, you know, um, from Mexican uh, culture or Hispanic folklore. And so it was like the Kukui, you know, um, there was the La Lechuza, La Lechuza? The Yorana, Yorana, I always get it mixed up because my name is, um, my last name, it's got the double L's into it. I, I took my husband's name, um, but I also hyphenated my name to be, you know, because I'm, I'm yeah. <sighs> Honestly, it's just a warning system for people so they know that I'm Mexican, so that way they just leave me the fuck alone if they are racist. So I kept my Mexican last name, my Spaniard last name as well, so I hyphenated it. And um, it to me, it's just like a warning system if somebody's racist or not against Hispanics. So um, my last name has the double L's in it. And so it, in Spanish, it makes a E, you know, so Yerona. Her name is La Yerona, the weeping woman, the crying woman, the screaming woman. woman. And my mom always told me stories about her um, you know, drowning her children and then also... Um, uh, seeking forever in guilt and shame in the afterlife, cursed and bound eternally by her actions, constantly looking for children. So when she finds children, she drowns them because she thinks that she, if she kills them, that then she can have them forever and stop seeking to satisfy the seek, you know? But, um, so it's so in, in Spanish and, you know, of course we had the, um, mm, what else do we have? We had the, the, the choose of the witch woman who's a shapeshifter, <clears throat> And um, you could always, the story that we heard as children, of course, the story evolves as you get older and you do other research, but this story we heard about the La Lechuza, the Lechuza, was that um, she was a woman who must have had a, a compact with the devil. And so he has granted her the powers to shift in the astral realm and leave her body at night to seek children to devour and you can tell if she's near you because in the trees when you shine a light the reflection of the eyes will come back blood red you know kind of thing like we were just always telling stories to each other as children sitting on those fence lines in the fields of endless summer um until the time i got my period <laughs> we were in the elysian fields oh Fuck, that's exactly what it was like. Oh, I'm gonna cry. Oh no. We were in these glorious Elysian fields of South Texas when we were just in this childlike ecstasy and wonder whenever I developed my when I started my period and everything got real fucking strange after that. Um and I think for women, like I'm speaking on a from a feminine woman perspective, somebody who does have a uterus will understand this. It doesn't matter how you categorize like what a female is. It's a child who owns, not owns, a child who has acquired a uterus via, you know, their life being born. It's a specific, I can't speak on men. I'm, I have tiny men growing. I have boys. Um, um, but and so I can't speak on that experience I really can't I can observe externally like the boyhood and I have a book I, I think it is there's a sacred masculinity that's extremely important to be respectful of because there's nothing wrong with masculinity there really isn't I'm extremely masculine as well so I have to honor that inside of me my animus or like you know they call it the anima the inner female and the animus the inner male and psychology or whatever but there is a divine masculinity as well as femininity that is that runs through life time and space because um when they you know is that popular or get, they get together you know it creates it is a creation process and it is very sacred and beautiful and strange and sometimes can be bizarre and horrific so I have this book called I'm Going to Botch It, but it I always call it Magician, Lover, Warrior, King. I don't know why, because I like the way 
the way that sounds magician lover warrior and then king but i believe it's called king warrior or warrior king no no it's called king warrior magician lover or something of that nature this is the name of the book but i think it is fascinating and it is a beautiful thing to have masculinity and to be a man um as well as like because like i said i can only speak from my experience my personal experience as being a woman but it is um for me observing men in western culture they do not have an initiatory practice that happens there is not every 28 days you must isolate and hide blood and um be shameful and 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 you know oh i said on my pants can everybody see does everybody know oh my god i'm so embarrassed like up until recent the past five years i just became okay with myself having a period which is weird because in western culture and a lot of cultures across the board there is this like isolation like for women if you're on your period you're not allowed to touch holy objects because it's is it taints for some reason the blood that sheds naturally without um <laughs> without violence bloodshed that is non-violent that naturally happens as a shedding process of the you know the feminine human anatomy uh it is absolutely repulsive to men and yet it is the one blood that happens without violence or without um any of that but in west so the females the females the uterus having individuals have to go through their own specific there's a walk that they have to do a dance they have to do down the stairs to descend into their primal their primordial underworld and understand what it means to you know what it means to have this and the consequences that lay ahead if you misuse your reproductive organs which are children venereal disease and things of that nature right that can forever shape your life so then your experiences are very very minimal you can't experience everything that you wanted to because well now you have kids or now you have some kind of like issue and now you can't just be sexually free and things like that there's a lot of danger the consequences of being there there is consequences of being a human uh, that has reproductive organs that are ripe for reproduction there's there's a huge consequence that happens within that and it's a uh, could be lifelong it could be forever how long does a bloodline last let's let's be honest how long does a human existence last now you're not just passing down um you're not just passing down your genetics okay there's also something very serious as in everything all of your ancestors and trauma and things like that familial trauma so you have to really really be aware of these consequences or not i mean people nobody really gives a fuck honestly but as a child i was hyper aware of the consequences of being a woman <laughs> the consequences of my existence so i just recently became um accepting and understanding of having a uterus and it, it's scary it really is scary but I, I, I hear and i don't know if this is true because it's just something that i've overheard is that once um well whenever at the the point of conception and then growth whenever the fetus is at a certain age where it develops sex within the body or within the you know the placenta and all those things if it decides to be depending on i guess i overheard that it, how warm your womb is is how how hot the womb is is, is the the temperature decides the um the sex allegedly i don't know if that's true i'm not a doctor but um i've overheard some things in my research like that and of course it could be you know whatever science is always changing always shifting and that's fine i don't i don't mind but um whenever the child determines the sex and if it is a woman and you are a woman because you have a baby inside of you so when you are born or not born i'm sorry let me back this up whenever you are developing the fetus within the body and you are at the age of you know having sexual reproductive organs as a human you develop eggs so within your mother's body you have eggs of children that will eventually be yours or not depending on if you want to reproduce and have children or if if it's a conscious thing or if it's an unconscious thing a lot of people end up 
they tend to be unconscious about their actions. So children end up being born out of very strange themes. There's a lovely book called The Hades Moon by Judy Hall. If you're into astrology, if you have a Hades Moon, I do. Pluto touches my moon. And, and moons are so fragile. They're so squishy and um, delicate. And Pluto, Hades, is such a um, huge weight for the brain and the moon and the mind and the emotions, your emotional health to be such aware of. It is a, um, it's not, it's like, it's like a volcano. It's dangerous. It can be dormant or sometimes it can explode and create new land um, and a new, you know, thing. But sometimes it is destructive or creative. That's the two sides of the coin. It's destructive or creative. And sometimes it's impulsive and sometimes it is just the, the siren sound of everything amalgamated in the underworld coming up to bloom. And whenever that touches your moon, in astrology, your moon, your mind, your feelings, your mother, the way you nurture things, the way you want to be seen and feel, and the way your emotions are working mechanically within the body, you know, um, it's very strange. Anyways, back to the, the Hades Moon is such a beautiful and glorious book by Madame <laughs> Judy Hall, who is a famous, to me, she's famous, famous and fabulous astrologer, and she also has a Hades moon and something that she talks about is like <sighs> people who have Hades moons have a tendency to clock out to go into the underworld and just act silently within you know the lights are off lights off and then they're just doing things um, because they think nobody can see them and when the lights come on everybody's covered in blood and all of the nasty taboo like things are revealed and then they scatter like roaches which is sad it's sad you don't have to do that so she speaks about how certain children sometimes are born out of um, impulses, such as like sometimes it's vengeance or revenge. Like the the conception happens because of certain feelings. And I guess that kind of gets passed down. Like when you truly have a child, when you really, really uh, conceive one, there's a moment of conception that happens. Two beings are evoking strange feelings through friction that come from a realm that is unseen and yet it creates a child so um there are these very very peculiar moments that can lead somebody to conception <laughs> to conceiving a child sometimes it's out of vengeance you know it's or just a, a basic primal need and other times it can be happy and lovely, but generally people who hold a Hades moon or a Plutonian moon or, or a moon conjuncting or aspecting Pluto or Hades in any way, it is a child with an extraordinary amount of burden upon their minds and um, it gives them a constant earpiece to the underworld. They constantly can hear the things that are shifting and sh shaking underneath the volcano or the dormant mountain and you know that that mountain can be dangerous because you hear it speaking you know what i mean there's all of these haunting things that can happen now one you can um one it's alarming because you start noticing i'm not like other people number two some people will i want to be like other people so addiction creeps its way in in order to have friends right because you all want to feel good but a person with a Hades moon, it's extremely karmic. It's extremely karmic, perhaps not just from you, but from your mother's actions and your grandmother's actions. Because when your mother was in your grandmother, you were in her eggs. You were in her ovaries. The, the, the material for your existence was within her ovaries. So that being said, how strange is it that you were passenger seat for all of your mother's life? You were witnessing her somehow in some way being affected, even just on like an atomic level or a chemical level on our smile, a small smile, a small um, genetic level. That information was pa passing through an experience was passing through her body into these eggs, you know. And so sometimes, um, you know, just the idea of conceiving a baby is, is to me extraordinarily serious and has perhaps everlasting consequences for a bloodline perhaps a child is born 
500 years from now who shares your blood and doesn't understand why they have such strange and bizarre experiences but it is like the passing down of experiences through blood and then also through the collective consciousness there's there's many many levels and layers of karma there's individual familial uh community you know it just goes out for as far as it goes out it's a rock in a pool and it ripples um until it reaches the edge of the pond or whatever but yeah so personally, I found it to be extremely exhausting and kind of embarrassing being a human being, being a, somebody who has a uterus. It's, it's, it's very, it's very sad um, because like I said, um, I, I remember those endless summers and those <laughs> Elysian <laughs> South Texas fields hanging out on the, the barn rails and just talking and joking and climbing trees and trying to catch grasshoppers, see who could get the biggest grasshopper, and talking about Sonic and all of our favorite games and, and funny things and making up, you know, playing, you know, pretending and playing and having fun. I remember those days, and I remember the day all of that stopped as well. So, yeah, and it wasn't that I was, I became pretty or something. I didn't, like, all of a sudden Venus out of a fucking you know, out of the ocean emerged and everyone was like, wow, you're magnificent. No, it was extremely confusing and very, very scary. And I, I like couldn't, I couldn't talk about it. So it, it's funny. Like, I think people should talk about it. I think men should be able to talk to men about stuff instead of constantly covering everything with humor because we are just too much uh, uh, afraid to talk about things that are real, 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 real. And so yeah, all of this being said, I think I'm going to go, I need to go put on my lipstick, but here's the thing. I haven't had coffee yet. This is me without coffee. Very fast, very this, whatever this is, this aspect of me. This is me, no coffee. And as soon as I drink coffee, I can't just go get a cup and go because then I will leave. This aspect of me will be gone because of um, caffeine. Uh, so yeah, what caffeine does to my personal body is it takes all of this, all of this like part of myself and it slows it down and adds humor and then I can I feel like I can relate to the people I live around you know I don't think that I could really truly have like the type or the quality of conversation that I want to have with people around here I think if I try to have this conversation with anybody within 100 miles of here uh, well, I was I'd say 45 within 45 miles of here that it would just be like lost they would be lost and be like, okay, well, I'll call your doctor and we can talk to them about how you feel. But yeah, I, I think it's just, I wanted to get ready. I wanted to show you guys how I did my face, which I think is funny because it kind of reminds me of a, I don't know, it's, it, it's funny. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How that went to this. And I was telling my son, he is really, 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 I'm about to go. That's Taco. No, 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 that's not Taco. That's Sven. I have a Swedish duck named Sven. And then I have a mallard named Taco. Um, anyways, I should go outside and see if they're okay. No, they're fine. If they hear me, they'll quack really loud. Because they want me to go outside and, like, hang out with them or whatever. So, anyways, my son, he does art. And I was telling him about shadows, contour, contrast, and highlights. And it was like he was like whoa what is that you know um because he saw me doing my makeup the other day and he was like what is wrong with your face that kind of thing and it was like no 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 wait 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 i'm gonna do this you look at me now you look at all these strange lines on my face and then i'm gonna go and blend them okay i'm gonna go blend them and then i'll turn back around and show you what i look like and so i did that and he goes wow how did you do that you shapeshifter what the heck um but yeah so uh, he he learned about shadows and contrast and highlights and now ever since that moment he's been hyper um kind of like obsessed with them so he's been doing research on different like art forms he's eight <laughs> he's been doing research on different type of um shadows and highlights and how light within a you know art casts certain um things and whatnot 
Okay, I'm gonna go. I also got this thing. It's like Milani setting spray. It's the first time I've ever used it yesterday, but my makeup lasted a long time. I ended up crying. I think around two o'clock in the morning for some reason or another. My dog came to check on me and I was like, it's fine. We're cool, man. I'm, I'm fine. But then she looked me right in the face and I was like, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I don't know why, but around two o'clock in the morning, I just needed release, I guess. I was just, I had to express that, let the steam out. So I was just like, I let myself have a good cry. And then my dog was like, whoa, bitch, are we fine? Are we okay? So anyways, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go drink coffee and then I have to start responding to things online, which takes a lot of time for me to do. I have to go respond to people and interact with humans. And then um, I have to go furthermore, to like get dressed and then go to this trampoline park that is completely dark. <laughs> and there's just kids bouncing everywhere, screaming, <sighs> you know, sliding, running, going this, that, that in the darkness. And I really have to like, figure out like my eldest he he's fine he's fine um and he's he's at the point where he'll come tell me but my youngest i want to shadow uh to an extent and um make sure he's okay so i just, you know it's still so anyways i'll see you guys later